In accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, PL 1975, Chapter 231, adequate notice of this regular meeting of the Planning Board of the Township of Franklin has been provided. And we ask that all board members, applicants, professionals, and members of the public please speak directly into the microphones so that our recording secretary can process the minutes. And applicants and professionals, please fill out the sheet on the table uh, when you've completed your testimony so that we get your spelling of your name right and all of that. Christine, ha I'll have her on dying gratitude for doing that. Um, but probably why you put it on the, but yeah. Um, so with that, um, let's please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Councilman Chase? Here. Coral Hauk? Here. Mahir Rafiq? Here. Cecile McIver? Here. Robert Mettler? Here. Mustafa Munzre? I don't see. Charles Brown? Here. Uh, Robert Thomas asked to be excused due to illness. Jennifer Ragno? Here. Carol Schmidt? Here. And Chairman Orsini? Here. Um, first order of business is the uh, regular meeting minutes from January 15th, 2020. If there are no needed corrections or clarifications. I'll under... move to approve. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chase has a. Yes. I, I just noticed on page four, they spell Reuben, R-E-U-B-E-N, which is perfectly reasonable, but I think it's actually R-U-B-I-N. They're not like the sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> with, with that duly noted yeah. correction. Then I move to approve. Listening to the tape, you wouldn't know. Do we have this a second? This is why we asked them to spell that. Uh, second. Okay, Cecile. And yes. Mark. Okay. Carl Hauk? Yes. Cecile McIver? Yes. Robert Mettler? Yes. Jennifer Ragno? Yes. And Chairman Orsini? Yes. <laughs> um, we have no resolutions tonight, right? So, um, Sycamore developers, extension of time? Good evening, everyone. Sherry Orenberg Ruggieri from Frank Linus's office. I'm here representing the owners of the property, the Resta family. I have with me tonight um, Frank V. Resta and Dolores M. Roland, if you have any questions. But we're here to request an extension of time for one year on the approvals and the subdivision uh, for the property described on the tax map block 423.01 lot 1.04, commonly known as 1865 Amwell Road. And this is your docket number PLN-17-00008. And it is anticipated that uh, compliance will be achieved by February 21st, 2021. So we're hoping it will just be a one-year extension. So um, since this is allowed by the municipal land use law that you can have uh, uh, up to three one-year extensions, um, I, I don't think there's much discussion, right? Are there any questions from the board at all? Well, today's the 19th. Yeah. One year will be February the 19th. That is true. 2021. Um, it expires the resolution memorializing uh, the... From the date of the resolution. Okay. So the resolution okay. was February 21st, 2018. And it was for preliminary and final uh, major subdivision approval and variance relief. Um, and again, that was memorialized on February 21st. Okay. So um, if there's no other questions, I'll entertain a motion to uh, grant the extension to that time. I'll make a motion to grant the extension. I will second it. Councilman Chase? Yes. Carl Hauk? Yes. Mahir Rafiq? Yes. Cecile McIver? Yes. Robert Mettler? Yes. Charles Brown? Yes. Jennifer Ragno? Yes. Carol Schmidt? Yes. And Chairman Rossini? Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'll sign the sheet. Yes, please. Please, that's, that's great.
Um, our next hearing is uh, PLN 19-00014, Essex Investment Property, LLC. Any public comments? Uh, oh, I do want to, oh, thank you, You're thank welcome. you. All right, um, back, back up for just a second, Peter. Um, this is the time during the meeting when we open to the public for any planning-related discussion that's not subject to its own hearing. So if you're here for Essex Investment, Right Rock Partners, or Inside Property Group, um, there'll be uh, an opening of the, uh, for public discussion on, on each of those applications as they are heard. So this would be for any other general planning comments. But with that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would move the uh, meeting be open to the public on any general planning item, excluding only those items which have their own public hearings later on in the meeting. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I'm staying. Okay, so it's carried. So now the meeting's open to the public. So anyone who'd like to come up and talk about anything not related to one of the hearings tonight. Uh, and by the way, Bob, thanks for the promotion, but Phil might have an issue with it. Oh. Some would call it a demotion. Uh, seeing no one coming forward, uh, I would move that the um, meeting be closed to the public. Second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Now we'll hear Essex Investment Property. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Peter Lanfrit appearing on behalf of the applicant in Essex Investment Property, LLC. Uh, this is an application for a minor subdivision approval to uh, create two lots uh, on property located at 383 Girard Avenue. The property in question consists of 32,000 square feet and there is currently on the property an existing single family dwelling. Uh, the purpose of this application is to create a second lot to build a new two family dwelling. Uh, there are certain bulk variances that are required in conjunction with this application uh, to with uh, lot frontage, uh, the setback of the existing house, which is an existing condition, and lot area. Uh, the zone requirement uh, in the zone is 15,000 square feet, except if you do not have public water or public sewer. The new house will have public water and sewer, so the new lot would be a conforming building lot as far as lot area. The existing house is serviced by a well. We are proposing to keep the well, so that would require one additional variance. Sorry, Peter. Say say that again one more time about the lot area. If it's connected to to public what water or sewer? Well, if, oh. if it is connected to both, it has to. It can be fifteen thousand square feet. If it is not connected to either public water or public sewer, then it has to be twenty. Okay. Thank okay. You. And the existing house has public sewer, but does not have public water. But you're going to connect it. No, the existing house. No, we're going to. We're asking to keep the well. So that has to be on a 20,000 square foot lot? Not right. But the I know I'm getting ahead, but I just want to understand before it's too late. Um, the, um, the new one will be connected to both? The new house will be connected to both public okay. water and public sewer. Therefore, the lot area is sufficient. OK. OK? Thanks. OK. All right. I do intend to call three witnesses this evening. They hopefully will all be brief. I have the applicant as well as his architect to describe the new house that we are building and our uh, surveyor who prepared the subdivision plan, who was also a licensed planner and will testify in support of the variances. Uh, the first witness is Mr. Sutton. If you could raise your right hand, do you swear the testimony you're going to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. If you could state your name, spell your last name, and give us your address for the record, please. Jared Sutton, S-U-T-T-O-N, 
Address is 10 Evergreen Road, Somerset, New Jersey, 08873. Mr. Sutton, you are one of the principals of Essex Investments? Yes. And what does Essex Investments do? Uh, purchases property to rehab and resale. Okay. And the property in question was purchased by Essex Investment when? Uh, June of 2018. And when you purchased the property, what was on the property? Uh, just the existing house and a vacant lot. Okay. Uh, and what was the condition of the house when you purchased it? <laughs> Terrible. Okay. Uh, I am going to ask, I have a series of five photographs, uh, which I would like to mark as one exhibit. Uh, That'd be fine. We can make that A1 okay. with today's date and the, and the application number. 219. And your application number is PL-19. Got it. Okay. Mr. Sutton, the photographs that we're gonna, we just marked 8-1 were taken by you? Yes. And they were taken by you right after you purchased the property, is that correct? Uh, prior to me purchasing it. Actually prior to it. Mm -hmm. And this was the condition of the property when you bought it? Yes, it was. When you purchased the property, Mr. Sutton, was the uh, house serviced by public sewer? Yes, it was. Okay, and was the house serviced by well water? Yes. Okay, after you purchased the house, uh, what did you do? Uh, rehab the interior, and I decided to maintain the well. Okay, and... When, in deciding to maintain the well, did you have to do any upgrades to the well? Uh, just minor things to get it working. Okay. It wasn't working when you bought the property? Right. And approximately how much money did you spend to upgrade or uh, get the well to work? Uh, $4,285. Okay. And at that time, did you know that if you, instead of upgrading the well, had just connected to the <coughs> public water system, you would not have needed a lot area variance? I did not. Okay, and I show you another set of photographs. Again, there's five of those. Uh, I will mark these A2. And with the docket number is requested by Mr. Vignolo. And these, fo these photographs were photographs taken by you after the house was renovated? Correct. Okay, and when were they taken approximately? Uh, May of la uh, 2019. Uh, Mr. Sun, with respect to the uh, existing dwelling, uh, if the subdivision is granted, do, uh, do you have a prospective buyer, and will this property be sold to that prospective buyer? Uh, I do. They, it's currently under contract. The potential buyers are currently renting the property, um, depending upon how everything goes with the subdivision. Okay. And ultimately, you will convey it to the, the current occupants of the property? Correct. Okay. And as I indicated in my opening remarks, you intend to build a new single-family dwelling on the adjoining lot. Is that correct? Correct. And that lot you will connect both to public water and public sewer. Correct. Thank you. I have no further questions. So I have a question, and it's noted in a staff report. Uh, what, what compelling reason would you have not to connect the existing house to public water? I mean, it just creates a variance that doesn't need to be created. Well, the, the, the reason is we, we have expended a 
fairly substantial amount to upgrade the well to make the house habitable. Uh, to now undo that would require an expenditure of additional monies, both in uh, bringing the water to the property and also to, again, go back into the house and retrofit the house uh, to have the water service hooked up. My concern, if, if, if I were a board member, would be more if the house had a septic system and public sewers was available, but the fact that there is private water or well water, in my opinion at least, is, is not a substantial detriment in any way. There are numerous, numerous houses in this municipality with, with wells, yeah. and this house had a well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess the thing is, you know, you, you could have sunk the money into upgrading the well and just connecting to public water and, and, and relieve the variance. So it just creates yeah. a situation that doesn't have to be created. Well, ha as Mr. Sutton said, had he known that when he set out to rehab the house, uh, he would have probably done that. Uh, however, uh, he was unaware that the uh, have not having public water would result in that one variance. The, the lots, again, w would be identical in size and would be identical in every which way, except for the fact that one has well and one doesn't. Did your client approach the township to maybe ask somebody in engineering or permitting? Well, he applied for, well, so he, he applied for permits to do the well water upgrade. Shouldn't shouldn't he? At that, I, I don't know. It just yeah. there's a disconnect somewhere. Yeah. Well, let me ask Mr. S Mr. Sutton before you started to rehab the house, uh, you came in and applied for all of the necessary building permits in order to take the microphone in in order to do the renovations. Correct. Okay. And the township issued all the permits to you. Correct. And. You know, at that time, did you have any discussion with anybody about possibly subdividing the lot, or was that even a thought initially? No, it was more so just to rehab the property, get it up, running, and performing. Okay, and, and so therefore, nobody ever indicated to you, hey, you know, if you connect it to public water, uh, you wouldn't eliminate a variance if you were going to subdivide in the future. Correct, I wasn't uh, aware of it. Okay, and, and there was no way that a, a township representative would be aware that you were intending or possibly going to subdivide the property in the future. Correct. Okay. I, I mean, you know, no, yeah. I, I, I get all that. It's just, and, and we can leave this discussion for your planner, but I'll just, I'll just give you a little prelude. Um, you know, C1 variance, the applicant must prove that the unique circumstances exist whereby strict application of the requirements would result in practical difficulties and undue hardship. I don't necessarily see that. And then as a C2 variance, a better zoning alternative, which I definitely don't see. So, I mean, again, it's just... It, it's going to be the board's decision. And, and if the board feels that uh, uh, us having to connect to public water will be required, obviously, uh, Mr. Sutton will then have to undertake that expense. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I, 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 I really do not see at least in my mind, any detriment to this leaving the situation the way it is. There is a functioning well on the property. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is a new and upgraded functioning well, not an old well that should be a concern to anyone that is sitting up there as a board member or anybody else. So, uh, and, and our position is that we would like to leave it. No, that, that's fine, and we can leave more of that to your, to your planner and see what kind of arguments they come up with. So, go ahead. Okay, I have no further questions of Mr. Sutton. Is the board? Just one question. That that well can be left for irrigation purposes. You know, so I yeah. mean, I, I think uh, how many other houses in the area are connected to wells? Most of this area, Gerard is built out, and I think, I would say more than ninety-five percent of the houses are probably on township water. I don't know if I, I don't know the answer to that to you, Mr. Sutton. I mean, I don't know the exact number, but I've done a few houses in that area, and there are some that are still connected to the well there. Um, the exact number I can't give you right now, mm -hmm. but there are still some in that older section of Girard, which is an older section of Franklin that still are serviced by well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, every, oh, once in a while, somebody comes up with the idea of having a mandatory tie-in ordinance for water. And it, it is at that moment you find out 
this room will be packed with people, many from this area, saying no. Uh, so uh, it's not unusual, as unusual as the density of the area might suggest, that there are a number of houses on wells. So um, I'll, I'll just add that in. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Well, I just observe that there's a reason why if a lot does not have, is not connected to public water or is not connected to the sewer, the lot size is larger. And that's because you need a larger area to collect the water to, for the well, really. And, and I'd ask Mr. Sutton, was it the well or the pump that you had to work on? What did you do to the well to make it work, as you put it? The holding tank or the compression tank was replaced. The pump was a submersible pump as compared to a, I guess, an above ground pump. And I apologize if my my labels are incorrect. Um, so it was an internal pump that was put in, um, not exposed, and the only thing exposed in the basement is the, the holding tank. What's the estimated cost to connect to public water? Um, township Township costs and connections are somewhere in the range of six to eight thousand dollars in that range, and then I would have to hire a plumber to run the lines from the curb into the house, uh, which would probably run me about another six thousand dollars, six to seven thousand dollars. And because the house now is uh, finished in the basement, I would now have to deconstruct, uh, connect in t inside the house, and then reconstruct, paint, patch, and put everything back to normal. So about triple or four times the cost of your, if not more. T township fees are fifty nine hundred dollars. Any other board questions? If not, I'm going to go. Ashraf. I do have one other quick question. Um, I don't know if you can answer this, but you are a real estate investor. Uh, would the value of the property increase if you were to connect to public water versus the well? In my opinion, it doesn't make a difference. Okay. Well, as long as uh, the well is in good shape and passes from a, a well test, which it did, um, it's relative either way. You could raise your right hand for me. Do you swear the testimony you're going to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You can state your name, spell your last name, and give us your address for the record, please. Ashraf Raghab, R-A-G-A-B. Uh, address is 2 Division Street, Suite 1 in Somerville, New Jersey, 08876. Ashraf, what is your occupation? Uh, I'm the principal of Amarok Design Studio, uh, registered architect. And you're licensed in the state of New Jersey? Yes. He's accepted. Thank you. And. You are going to, or you have designed the house that was going is going to be constructed on the new lot. Is that correct? That's Should the correct. board grant the subdivision approval? Yes, that's All correct. All right. Can you briefly describe what we are go proposing to construct on the new lot? Uh, and, and just for the record, what you're going to refer to is the plan set that was originally submitted in conjunction with this application. Is that correct? Uh, yes, p part of it. We, we submitted a full set of right. construction documents. We just have here the, the plans and elevations. Yes. But they are part of the original submission? Yes, correct. So I therefore don't have to mark them. Is that correct, Mr. Vignello, or do you want them marked? Yeah. Okay. Proceed. So, uh, uh, what, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, what we're proposing is a, a single-family uh, colonial uh, house. Uh, total, habitable, <coughs> total habitable area is about a little bit over 3,000 square foot. Uh, the height is a little short of 34 feet. Uh, 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 typical, you know, uh, siding uh, with a stone base, 
Uh, there is a small entry porch in the front, uh, two-car garage uh, right next to the entrance front loading. Uh, a, a bit of a tight design because of the layout of the house and the size of the lot. So, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, living dining on a vertical alignment with a kitchen in the back, family room to the right side, and the two-car garage occupies the lower right corner of the residence. Uh, there is a finished basement with a bathroom that is proposed. Uh, second floor has uh, four bedrooms and a laundry room, uh, one common bathroom, and one master bathroom. So four bedrooms, two baths. Uh, and there is a finished attic with a bathroom also uh, uh, that with a staircase dedicated to go up to the attic. And, and Ashraf, you're familiar with the neighborhood in which this house is going to be constructed? Yes. Okay, and is it consistent and compatible with what's in the area? Yes. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. So the only only architectural question that was noted on the uh, noted on the township report was the uh, it says the uh, was uh, number five. You uh, does that uh, how does that factor in? The the report indicates that the uh, whether the finished space qualifies as a half story for the attic. Uh, and again, if, if there's a determination by the building department that it is, uh, well, first of all, two and a half stories are permitted in the zone. Uh, that's kind of what I wanted yeah. to know. Yeah. Would, would it affect any anything? But did, yeah. did, did, so the, the hatched area in the attic, uh, that is what's considered a habitable area. That's where the, the roof exceeds the, the height of a habitable area. The areas on the sides uh, where the roof slopes down, so they're not considered habitable. So. You know, we tabulated the area of the attic that is habitable, and it is less than half of the second floor. Uh, it, it, the, the crux of the matter is that that's really not before the board. This is for a, a subdivision application. Yeah, yeah. I, no, was I just wanted to make sure that, you know, anything, you know, wouldn't exceed whatever was allowed yeah. in there. Well, I'm, okay. I'm alerting, the purpose of that is I'm alerting them that at the time of the building permit, I'm going to be looking into that issue and making a deter determination whether that third floor constitutes a half story or a full story. Um, I didn't do that analysis as part of this because they're not, they weren't looking for a height variance, they're looking for a subdivision, and they may or may not have to change that, that third floor. And, okay. and, and so. just for the record, we're intending to construct a two and a half story house, so when we if the board were to approve this, the house will be two and a half story in, in compliance. We're not seeking any deviations, or will not be seeking any devi deviations. Thank you, Peter. Any board questions for the architect? Okay, Mr. Fisk. Thank you. Peter, can we get him the microphone? There we go. Do you swear the testimony you're going to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. If you could state your name, spell your last name, and give us your address for the record, please. Stephen with a PH, F I S K, 631 Union Avenue, Middlesex, New Jersey. I'm a licensed professional land surveyor and professional planner. Mis Mr. Fisk has been before this board many times, so assuming that you uh, haven't been drummed out of the core? No, I'm um, currently seven. licensed. Excellent. Okay. M Mr. Fisk, uh, you prepared the subdivision plan, which is the subject of this application. Yes. And you <coughs> have mounted on the board to our left sheet one of the subdivision plan? Yes. Okay, and you did put some coloring on part of sheet one, did you not? I did put some uh, blue dots on the key map. That's the only alteration I made to this print, uh, which indicate the number of lots that are deficient in width in this zone within the area of the subdivision. Okay, can you there therefore mark that uh, document as A3, please? With today's date, Pursuant to Mr. Vignola's request, the docket number PLN 
Mr. Fisk, uh, first of all, can you describe the subject property as it currently exists today? Well, as you uh, said in your opening, the subject properties in the R15 zone on Gerard Avenue, a total area of 32,000 square feet with a width of uh, 160 feet and depth of 200 feet. And it contains an existing one and a half story dwelling uh, which has a uh, front setback to the porch of just over 18 feet, which requires a variance for an existing condition. Uh, the subdivision, uh, as it uh, has been submitted, is for two 80-foot wide lots, whereas 100 feet is required. Now, in this area, within 200 feet, of this property, there are 17 additional lots, and uh, 12 of those lots out of 17 are deficient in width. In fact, uh, 10 of them are 80 feet or less wide, as the applicant is requesting. And if you go a little bit further and take the whole block that we're in, uh, 15 out of 18 lots are less than 100 feet wide. Uh, therefore, this uh, lot layout will be compatible to the neighborhood and not be detrimental in any way as far as the lot width. There are no other variances being requested as far as bulk variances. Uh, the coverage on the property proposed uh, is much less than uh, that is allowed, uh, about half or less. Uh, so we're not overbuilding on this lot. The, the lots are more than 15,000 square feet each. And as uh, the applicant and Mr. Lanford mentioned, uh, one additional variance is required uh, because the applicant would like to maintain the existing well at the existing dwelling. Therefore, that lot would require 20,000 square feet. Uh, I don't see any reason why that is detrimental and uh, what I can say is that uh, looking at it from a density point of view, which is why the township is requiring the 20,000 square feet for either a private sewer or private well, uh, if you take both lots together, it's 32,000 square feet with one well. And that would be a reason for the board uh, to approve this uh, since the applicant is not asking for two wells on 32,000 square feet. This is true. Um, pursuant to one of the earlier questions, do you, do you have any estimate of the number of houses in this area that might be in similar situations? Not. I mean, your other two variances, one is existing. You're not exacerbating it. The minimum front yard setback. The minimum lot frontage is fairly minimal. Um, so can you, can you let the board know what you would propose their criteria be for each of them? Uh, estimation, C1, C2? As, as far as the uh, variances that we're requesting for lot width, uh, that would be a C2 variance. Uh, it's not detrimental to the neighborhood in any way, and the, the benefits of the usage of the land outweighs any detriment. Uh, this piece of property happens to be the largest lot in the entire area. Uh, there are no other lots that are this uh, large, uh, so it's impossible that uh, another subdivision is even going to occur in this area asking for 80 feet uh, in width for each lot. Uh, and as I've stated, the vast majority of the lots are 80 feet wide exactly. Uh, some are a little less and two are 90 feet wide, but the general neighborhood uh, is about 80 feet wide per lot. Uh, they have the area. Okay. Uh, what about your, your front yard, your existing front yard setback? Well, I, I would consider that uh, 
a hardship. The house is existing has just been renovated. Uh, looks very nice at the moment. And uh, most of the uh, deficiency in the front yard is uh, the porch, which is about 6.8 feet uh, in depth. So the, the actual house is almost 25 feet back. Uh, I don't see a, a problem with that. There are other houses in the neighborhood that are as close or closer to the front yard, uh, to the front line, I mean. And uh, last but certainly not least, what would be your professional opinion regarding the uh, lot size in terms of criteria? Well, as I previously stated, I, I think I would look at it from a density point of view in having one well on essentially 32,000 square feet. Uh, even though the lot itself is only 16,000, I don't think there's any detriment to having that. Uh, there's been testimony that there are other properties that have wells. Uh, a study could certainly be done, but uh, Mr. Mettler and the applicant have both said that they are aware that there are other wells in the area. So you're arguing for C2 on that? Yes. <laughs> you have any other? I have no other questions of Mr. Well, Fisk. I have uh, a little bit more. I think we should. We got the staff reports. We but should mention the staff reports. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, just before we move on from the variances, um, for the lot frontage, um, Mr. Fisk was arguing a C2. Um, for the frontage variances, I, I, th I don't know if that really applies. I don't know if that's a better zoning alternative. I, I would say that it's actually a C1. The lot the existing lot width is 160 feet. Um, there is no opportunity to gain more lot width. Uh, the lots to either side are developed. Those homes are um, on either side are pretty close to this property line. So I don't think the ap applicant has an opportunity to make two compliant lots at 100 feet, uh, 100 foot width. So I would say the frontage variances are actually C1 variances. Um, as far as the lot area variance, um, I think what, what Mr. Fisk has been addressing the entire time is the negative criteria, lack of a, a detrimental impact. I don't know if he's necessarily addressed the positive criteria, which is either a hardship or a benefit. I'll leave that to the board to decide, but I, I've not heard too much. <coughs> and, and, I, and I should uh, mention that the financial discussion that was discussed earlier on can't be used to support a hardship for a variance. So there needs to be some aspect unique to this lot that creates this hardship situation. Or again, some detrimental or some positive aspect of it that's a better zoning alternative compared to something that complies. What, what's your response to uh, those arguments, Mr. Fisk? The first uh, statement regarding the uh, lot width uh, I believe it could be either a C2 or a C1. I would certainly agree that a C1 could apply also since the shape of the property dictates uh, our need for the variance, even though we have excess area f zone wise. Uh, I think I've stated about all the reasons I can regarding the well situation. Mr. Mr. Fisk, uh, you've had a chance to review the TRC report dated January 21st, 2020, uh, which consists of, of actually four pages of comments. Uh, can we comply with all of the requested uh, changes or modifications or information that we have to supply to the staff? Uh, should the board grant this approval? Yes, with the exception of the one item regarding the well. Okay, and in doing what we have to do to comply, would that in any way substantially alter or change what the board is looking at this evening? No. Okay, thank you. There is one other memorandum that we did receive from the Environmental Commission dated uh, January 13th was the meeting and they were requesting that we 
change some of the proposed trees on the lot uh, <coughs> for the reason uh, that the property to the northeast or left of the subject property has a solar array, I believe, on the rear of their roof. And uh, the commission thought that we should make those trees a little bit lower as far as specifying what type, and we agree to that. Yeah, great. And what about the uh, um, lighting? I don't know exactly what lighting they're talking about. The, is there, there is no lighting. Neither do I. Being proposed with conju in conjunction with this application, there's there's a house house light on the existing house, uh, which is a standard house fixture, and the new house will have standard house fi house fixtures. We're not installing any street lights or any other lighting of any kind. And I'm, the third comment, I'm not sure what that means. I think it might have been misworded. Yeah, um, doesn't have the right lot number, so I'm not referring to there. Uh, anybody's moving anything? Um, all right. Uh, does the board have any questions for Mr. Fitt? Before we open to the public, any of the other witnesses? If not, I'll entertain a motion to open the public. I move to open to the public. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is open to the public for comment on this application. Seeing no one coming forward on this application, I would move that its public hearing be closed. Second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is closed. Any uh, final summaries, Peter? Just, just very briefly. Uh, as you can see from the exhibits A1 and A2 of uh, the dramatic change to the existing dwelling that uh, Mr. Sutton undertook, uh, which was obviously a benefit uh, to the neighborhood and the construction of a new house on the property is also going to be a benefit uh, to the neighborhood where any time in an older section of a municipality new construction comes into place, uh, it is a benefit. Uh, I think the issue uh, of the uh, connecting to the public water uh, is really up to the board whether to grant the relief that we requested. Uh, again, sometimes hindsight is 2020. Had Mr. Sutton known from day one that he could have eliminated a variance, he would have uh, eliminated it by connecting the existing house to the uh, public water system. I think the point that's being made by Mr. Fisk is that what we really have here is one well on 32,000 square feet. So in, in the overall scheme of things, there really is no detrimental impact. Uh, and, and the question I, I think that Mr. Brown also asked is, you know, is there a difference from a marketability point of view uh, from having well water or municipal water, and, and there isn't. Uh, so, in our opinion, uh, the applicant uh, has done or tried to do from the day one what he uh, thought was the right and appropriate thing to do. The board can obviously say, no, you have to connect to the uh, uh, public water system, but I think given in this, this circumstance, there is no negative impact. And, and, you know, the, the house has now been finished, uh, and it's been finished at a great expense, and to ask an applicant to tear something out uh, to comply with an ordinance when, when the net effect is a, a zero other than, and I know we can't talk about economics, but the net effect is that it doesn't have any impact on the existing house nor on any of the surrounding houses. And I, I would respectfully request that the board grant the variance for uh, the lot area because we do not have a connection to public water and not require us to do so. Thank you, Peter. A any uh, further board discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, if Franklin had a mandatory tie-in ordinance, that would be one thing. But we don't, so. Uh, therefore, I'm reluctant to try and suggest that 
the applicant needs to tie in. Uh, knowing that the well has been rehabilitated, tested, and is working, and is uh, perfectly safe. Well, Ted? I think there is a point, as made by Mr. Fisk, that um, the two lots with the one well provide sufficient catchment to provide water for the well. And of course, that's really a function of a lot of things in terms of the soil and the rocks underneath and so forth. But uh, the objective of the ordinance is met by having that much um, lot, even if it be two lots, around the well. So given that, and given the substantial expense that the applicant has already gone to with respect to the well, and the considerable further expense that there would be to connect to uh, the street, the public water uh, main, I go along with uh, approving the variance for the lot size, even though it's doesn't meet the strict requirement of the ordinance for a lot without uh, the public water connection. It, but just don't do it again. Mr. Lanfred, just one question. Uh, I know we're talking about one lot, uh, actually, one well on two lots for 32,000 square feet. Would the applicant be willing to agree that the uh, property that's going to be connected to public water and sewer uh, be deed restricted to not have a well on it? Because obviously they're connected to public water, but they could have an irrigation system for everything else. We, we don't have a problem with that restriction. Any other comments from the board? Right, if not, well, there's no other discussion, and I'll mention that uh, the fact that it's that they are going to be hooked up to the sewer makes a difference too oh, with an undersized <laughs> lot. Uh, but I'll make a motion to approve this application with the condition that they will agree to a deed restriction. Yes, do I have a second? Uh, I'll second it. Yes, Councilman Chase. Yes. Carl Houck. I, I believe that the lot area that I'm going to vote no. Uh, Mahir Rafiq. Yes. Cecile McIver. Yes. Robert Mettler. Yes. Charles Brown. Yes. Jennifer Ragnow. Yes. Carol Schmidt? Yes. Yes? Okay. And Chairman Rossini? Yes. Thank you very much. All right. And next application is White Rock Partners and Gray Rock Partners, PLN 19-00017. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Donald Whitelaw for the Applicants Gray Rock and White Rock Partners, LLC. Uh, Mr. Fisk is also on this application. He's setting up our uh, plan set. Uh, this is also a, a minor subdivision application where we are seeking approval to uh, make one vacant lot into two vacant lots. The property is it's located on, uh, along Elizabeth, Elizabeth Avenue 
on the northern section of the township by the southbound uh, border. Uh, Gray Rock and White Rock about 13 years ago acquired a number of sections of property from the FDIC uh, in this area. They've had several applications before this board uh, in the past. This is really the last lot available. Uh, there are existing conditions with this lot. It's very large. It's 90,000 square feet. We're proposing a lot at 50,000 square feet and 40,000 square feet. They will be well-serviced lots, so we, the minimum is 20,000. So we're about double and more on the proposed lots. Uh, it's an unusual piece because it's a through lot from Elizabeth to Madison and Hall to the Paper Street Halsey. So whatever we do, it's going to be a through lot. Um, <laughs> section along Elizabeth Avenue is 100 feet uh, in width, 105 feet is required in this uh, zone, so that is an existing condition. Um, also, that's along Madison, because we have essentially the whole block, there are corner lots. Uh, so that, that poses some issues. Because we have uh, 100 feet and need 105, we contacted the adjoining owners uh, to see if they would consider purchasing either of our uh, properties. Uh, the, the lot to the south <coughs> of us has, is a 50 by 100 uh, lot, has a house on it. They have no land to sell to us. The lot to the north of us is a vacant uh, lot, also 50 by 100. Uh, those owners actually contacted us and we had a meeting with them to see if we could convince them to buy one of our lots, but that didn't work out. Uh, and because it's undersized, there's really no way to acquire part of their property to make ours conforming. But with that, um, I'm going to present Mr. Fisk. I do have the representatives from the owners here, but based upon the um, Technical Review Committee report, it's mostly a technical uh, variant, so I'm going to hopefully rely on Mr. Fisk and questions from the board. Uh, the owners are available if necessary. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very technical. So. Uh the one question I have is because of the wetlands averaging and the amount that you'll need to leave for open space of some sort, will that be distributed over both lots or is one lot going to be building lot and one lot going to be the open space? And no, this will be um, split down the middle so they're side by side and both will be impacted by wetlands and conservation dedications and fully required. Mr. Fisk will go through that. Uh, so, with, I know he was qualified at the last one, but I would ask that uh, he be uh, sworn and qualified. If do you swear the testimony you're going to provide us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. For the record, one more time, your first name, last name, and your address, please. Stephen with a PH, FISK, 631 Union Avenue, Middlesex, New Jersey. Um, and Mr. Fisk, in the last uh, three and a half minutes, your qualifications have not been detrimentally <laughs> affected? I'm still licensed as a professional land surveyor and professional planner. Perfect. Thank you, sir. And he's still accepted. Uh, Mr. Fisk, you prepared the subdivision plan for this application? Yes. Could you uh, describe it briefly for the board? Well, uh, this property is in the R10 zone, which requires 10,000 square feet. However, uh, both of these lots have a proposed well on them. Therefore, each lot has a minimum requirement of 20,000 square feet. The proposal is for one lot to be 50,000 and the second lot 40,000 square feet. Uh, there are significant wetlands uh, on a portion of the property. A DEP application uh, for the delineation of the wetlands has been approved, a permit has been approved by the DEP for wetlands averaging. And we have shown a conservation easement uh, which covers all of that uh, new buffer area to the wetland averaging point or beyond it uh, to be dedicated to the township. Uh, there is still significant land available in order to build a single family dwelling on each of the two lots. Uh, this property is odd-shaped, and uh, as Mr. Whitelaw stated, uh, one of the properties will be a through lot, 
and uh, both of the properties will be corner lots because they this property takes up almost all of the entire block bordered by four streets. Uh, I believe we have a hardship for our variances because of the shape of this property. Uh, the actual lot width requirement in the zone is 100 feet. However, when a lot is a corner lot, 105 feet is required. We uh, only have 200 feet along Madison Avenue on the west side of the property, and each lot will have 100, therefore requiring a lot width variance at that point. We also have 100 feet of existing frontage on Elizabeth Avenue, but because this lot is a corner lot, uh, 105 feet is required, which creates uh, doesn't create another variance. Uh, it, it is a variance whether there's a subdivision or not. Uh, the fourth variance is for uh, a through lot because lot 1.01 uh, runs from Elizabeth Avenue through to Halsey Street and Madison Avenue and is not uh, completely a corner lot so it, it therefore qualifies to be a through lot also. Uh, this again is the result of the shape of the lot. Uh, I don't see any problem or detriment with the fact that it's a through lot. Only one access is being proposed at this time uh, because Halsey Street is unimproved. Uh, we will be obtaining Somerset County approval to have a driveway come out to Elizabeth Avenue for lot 1.01. 1 .01. Uh, we are also asking for uh, waivers for street sidewalk and curb along the township streets of uh, Halsey, Madison, and Hall. Uh, there are no curbs or sidewalks in this part of the neighborhood. Uh, I don't believe the county is going to ask for a sidewalk, but there would be county jurisdiction along Elizabeth Avenue if they do. And obviously we will comply with any county requirement. Uh, basically that covers what we are trying to accomplish here and there was a TRC memorandum issued for this subdivision and we don't have any problems with any of the comments uh, in that memorandum we will comply with all of them uh, none of them are going to affect what the board is seeing in front of them or is any changes to the plans? Well, Mr. Fisk, in your opinion, this is a C1 hardship variance based upon the configuration and shape of the lot and the pre existing conditions with the uh, variances that exist. Is that correct? Yes, and as far as uh, negative criteria, I don't believe there's any negative impact to the public. Uh, these lots are grossly oversized. Uh, there are many much smaller lots in the area. We're not asking for a lot size variance. Uh, we have more than double what is needed, even with the uh, proposed wells. And I would also point out to the board, it's come up in some of the others, um, and it's noted on Mr. Fisk's plan that these would be um, slab on grade houses, no basements in this part of town. Yes, we, we have noted that soil testing has been done on this property to establish whether or not a basement could be constructed, and it cannot. <coughs> Those are the questions I have for Mr. Fisk. All right. Um, questions from the board? Uh, one of the things that we require applicants to do when they want to be excused from building curbs and sidewalks is to put the money towards our sidewalk fund because we don't know in the future or how soon in the future an area will develop. And, uh, and then sidewalks and curbs become necessary. So do you agree to do that? We can comply with that, yes. Okay. 
Any other questions from the board? Uh, two questions. Um, the sewer to lot 5.01 is going to be via an easement over lot 1.01 um, to get access to the sewer line in Elizabeth. Have you had a discussion with the sewers authority about that? Will they agree to um, providing that connection through an easement? I don't know if we've had a direct uh, communication with them yet. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't. In the past, the sewers authority has said they wanted the lines to be on the actual lots themselves and not via an easement. So. <coughs> It could be, I mean, I guess you're taking a chance that they'll agree to that arrangement. Yes, we would ask for approval subject to the sewer authority's approval. Um, and then just, to, I'm just curious, the lot on one, or the house on 1.01, you've kind of pushed it back, um, you know, re pretty far back on the lot. I'm just curious why you're reflecting that, like that. Why, why not put the house closer to Elizabeth Avenue and have a, you know, smaller driveway? The main reason for that was to create an area for a turnaround because uh, we're not going to back cars out onto Elizabeth Avenue. It gives you more room to have a, a usable area of the lot <coughs> in a backyard, I guess? Yeah, th this lot does have a, uh, a fairly large backyard. It's not as uh, constricted as uh, lot 5.01. So we have the room to do this, and it uh, uh, allows parking or a turnaround area in front of the house that isn't 10 feet away from the house. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, um, entertain a motion for opening the public. I'll make a motion to open to the public. Second. Favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting is open to the public. I guess I'm the public. Um, I have a copy of what I'm going to read. Oh, before you um, get started, um, be sworn in. Yeah, and say, you could raise your right hand for the address. Do you swear the t testimony you're going to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. If you could state your name, spell your last name, and give us your address for the record, please. My name is Charles Hutton Moser. My last name is spelled H U E T T E N R. I live at 328 Elizabeth Avenue. Sir, can you push the mic up? Uh, we, have, okay. we have to make sure we pick you up. And then speak directly into the mic, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Charles Hutt Moser. I live at 328 Elizabeth Avenue, Somerset, New Jersey, 088873. Um, my last name, the spelling is H-U-E-T-T-E-N-M-O-S-E-R. I have a copy of what I'm going to read. If anybody, I could pass a copy around. Are you reading it? it yep. Okay. My understanding is that the building, the builder is requesting specific variances that apply to minor subdivisions, also ones that do not require approval by the planning board due to hardship, hardship on a developer. I'm not clear about what this means. This property has been deemed a wetlands area many years ago. It has come up for development a couple of times, and each time the variance to build, regardless of the conversation easement to protect the streams and the wetlands. There is a good deal of development happening in now uh, around this area of the township wetlands. We want the best possible outcome for everyone involved, including the environment. If denial of some of the variances cause hardship to the developer and not the environment, this is most important because the environment serves us all. If some of the lots are buildable, then it should be allowed. Otherwise, we ask the planning board to allow this land to remain undisturbed and forever wild as ordinance, as township ordinance 112-17B reads. Lot 101.1 is a through lot, an existing condition, which requires a variance from the township ordinance section 112-17B, which reads, a conversation easement is a piece of land dedicated to protect or protecting specific environmentally sensitive features such as streams and wetlands. This is done by limiting the type and the amount of development that may take place on or near an important environmental resource. This restriction says with the land, stays with the land and each new owner of the property must abide by the terms of the easement. Conversation easement must remain in a natural state and not be used or altered in any way. 
This, this includes the building of structures, placing of fences, and mowing of grass. The easement area is intended to remain undisturbed and forever wild. Um, conversation easements protect a variety of features, including water quality and critical plant and wildlife habitats by creating buffers around environmentally sensitive areas. In addition, a properly preserved easement provides scenic views, preserving an aesthetic and natural environment for all the residents of Franklin Township. Thank you for your time and attention to this important environmental issue, Charles and Margaret Cuttenmoser. And I have a map that goes back uh, to 2001. It was sent to us by the township. Um, personally, everybody has a right to build if it's done properly. I know that there are buildable lots back there. And that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know, Mark, if you want to ad address some of that from a planning well, standpoint. I, I think it, I think it's really on the applicant to respond to that. I, I think, I mean, I think there are some pretty obvious responses to that in that they're proposing lots that are multiple, at least double if not, you know, two and a half times the minimum required, and they have basically avoided the wetlands entirely and propose a conservation easement over those wetlands to protect them. Um, if the applicant wants to address more than that. Sure, just really quick. Um, we are actually complying with, the, with exactly um, the citizen read because we are providing for exactly the conservation easement that he described. Um, so this will be forever now in uh, this township. This area will be a conservation easement, which it is really not right now. So we feel we're in full compliance and we are only building on available dry uplands. Any other members of the public wishing to come forward? Seeing no one else coming forward, I would move that the public hearing on this application be closed. All in favor? Aye. 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 There comments, board or questions? I have a question. Um, does the applicant, are you involved in any other developments in town? Uh, well, the applicant has built in this general area in similar situations, a lot or two here or there. So if you go up Elizabeth Avenue, you can see some of the homes that they have built in these areas. Some of these lots have been sold to other um, single lot um, builders. Uh, they, they're, they're not a big um, developer. They don't do 100 unit or 100 uh, subdivision houses or things like that. So they're all on Elizabeth Avenue? Right, and they're in the, these pockets. Uh, um, there's a lot of paper streets that go here, and um, so some of the lots were available to be developed. A lot of it is wetlands and, and couldn't be developed. We've done other conservation easements and dedications along the way here with those uh, developments. And most of those houses are slab homes. There are a couple of basements that we learned our lesson on um, mm. because you know, it requires significant uh, sump pump issues that we'd like to avoid. Thank you. Bless you. Anybody else? And also, you said the Department of Environmental Protection has already agreed to this. To the location, to the location of the wetlands and to the uh, buffer averaging that's all within the conservation easement being offered. So that's already been approved? Yes, ma'am. All right. If there's no other comment, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve this application. Second. Councilman Chase? Yes, I, th I think the applicant could have made the point that the hardship involved is the very substantial wetlands across the middle of the property and that you and I commend you for not trying to squeeze in a lot on fronting on Madison Street. <laughs> uh, and therefore, you had to divide the property in the way that has made it the through lot uh, and corner lot requirement. So that's really the hardship which generates the variances. So I think it's 
uh, variances are justified. Carl Houck? Yes. Mahir Rafiq? Yes. Cecile McIver? Yes. Robert Mettler? Yes. Charles Brown? I'm going to say yes, but I'm also going to um, say what Marx stated in questioning the driveway. I think that the design could have been done in a way um, so much so that you wouldn't require such an imposing driveway to that house, and thus the home could have been moved closer to Elizabeth Avenue. But yes. Jennifer Ragno? Yes. Carol Schmidt? And Chairman Orsini? Yes. Well, we're in the transition period. Uh, the last application for tonight is Inside Property Group, PLN So for our new board member and, and anybody else who may not remember, um, this applicant did come before the board with a concept plan uh, reflecting what they're uh, presenting before us tonight. So. It's all yours. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Chairman Bob Smith, I'm a licensed attorney in the state of New Jersey. And I'm here tonight representing Insight Property in uh, 619 Somerset Street, LLC. Um, the property uh, is Block 162, Lots 19 through 34, Block 163, Lots 1 through 20, which is in the Renaissance Commercial Zone, the RC Zone, and Block 162, Lot 35 through 38, which is in the R7 Residential Zone. What we are here seeking tonight is a three-lot subdivision, uh, and a, we are seeking preliminary and final site plan on a uh, 39,040 square foot self-storage facility, and we're seeking preliminary site plan only, not final site plan, preliminary uh, site plan only on the quick uh, food service restaurant. And the reason for that is we don't have the tenant yet. We think it's appropriate to come back to the board when the tenant is known and f to give the board another opportunity to <coughs> make sure that everything works. Uh, there are no variances or deviations being sought tonight. And uh, the chairman has already mentioned we came back, we came to the planning board earlier last year to get some guidance and direction. You were kind enough to give it to us. I would also point out that we've had at least four technical review committee meetings with the staff over the course of the year to make sure we're doing this right and in the best interest of the township. And I would say for the record that that guidance was uh, invaluable. Right? They gave us great ideas about how to do this uh, uh, in, the right, in the right way. Um, there was only one s sign variance that people had missed, and that was that uh, we had more than one sign per building, but I will point out to you that up front that we're not seeking that variance. We will live with the ordinance which says one sign per building. Um, so it's my intention to call uh, several witnesses tonight. I have seated to my right Paul Brown, who is the owner of the uh, property. Secondly, Mr. Grant Lewis, who's our professional uh, engineer. Uh, we also have Mr. Andrew uh, Ferranda, who is our traffic expert, and then finally we have Brooke uh, Shea, who is our architect, to describe what the project will look like, which we think is stupendous, but that's our particular prejudice. So uh, that being said, I'd ask that Mr. Brown be sworn so that he can give testimony. Microphone. Perfect. Do you swear the testimony you're going to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. You'd state your name, spell your last name, and give us your address for the record, please. Paul Brown, B-R-O-W-N, and address is um, 
446 West Plant Street, Winter Garden, Florida, 34787. Okay. All right, Mr. Brown, uh, uh, for the record, I've introduced you as the owner of the property. Have I misstated that? Uh, one of the partners of the property. Projects of this magnitude take many people to happen, but I'm the general partner in the partnership. For okay, that. and maybe you could tell us a little bit about your history in the self-storage industry and a little bit about the current uh, company that you're with. Yeah, sorry to be redundant. I know four months ago I came here and kind of laid it all out on the line for everybody, but we're owner and operator of self-storage facilities. Um, we've been in the business for over a decade and have owned and operated about 100 properties. Um, Insight Property Group is made up of me and four partners, um, one of which is my older brother who still sits in an office and tells me what to do. So that <laughs> has never changed. <laughs> um, and then two of which are here and, um, and the other two are, are back at the office. Um, Insight Property Group uh, specializes in building new self-storage facilities where a majority of the ones I've owned in the past were existing. Um, and the reason for this partnership is I believe the storage industry um, deserves to have much better projects and property types, and that's why we're here to help push it forward. And I, I believe you have a, a slide presentation that we might be able to show? To yes, I do. Um, let me put this down. Thank you for using the monitor. I left the fog machines at home, but we'll try to show some pictures. For what it's worth, we put that in our memos. I think Christine puts it on the things that she provides to the applicants to remind them to provide this. It's better for the board. It's better for the public. Um, and we're going to try to bang that drum a little more to try to get applicants to present like. And for the, rec for the record, we follow directions. Um, so this is a picture, a street view of the property uh, off Somerset Road. Um, as we've worked with the town over the last, I think, 12 or 18 months. Oddly enough, this is one of the first projects we looked at with Insight Property Group, and we are now at number 20, and this one's still started. So we've been working with the town very closely for a long time to come to where we're at. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, quick history of all the locations we've built um, self-storage and operate at. The next. Um, this is what a lot of the stuff I've built and owned in the past looks like. Um, but he wants to drive by that and see that. But that's the cheapest and most economical way to do this. And it's what has become known as the product type over the last 10 years. And um, I'm just not interested in doing that. This is the, the typical traditional self storage. We'll go to the next one. Um, here's some of the projects we have currently built or are under construction. Um, here's our project right here. Um, this is in uh, Garden Grove, California. This is in Titusville, Florida. This is in Staten Island, New York. And this one is uh, being developed in uh, Long Beach, California. So really pleasing designs. We have some of the best architectural consultants and designers that I think are out there at all. So next slide. This is our current northeast footprint. Um, we like to keep enough properties in a location where we can have a strong management team, um, help relief if people need a day off or a week off. We're really big on work-life balance and somebody needs to go home or go to a football game or go to a soccer game, there's always someone around that can help operate the facility in the meantime. Here's our footprint right here in the New Jersey area. Next. Um, this is a picture of the project or the site as it stands. This is Frank's Hardware Store. Um, it has been owned and operated for a long time. Over the years, they've kind of expanded some of their storage space into the back of the property. Um, this is where you all know the Wawa gas station currently sits, and we have Rutgers University up here. Oh, the next one. Um, just another 
aerial view of the property. This one's a little bit more updated, showing the update with uh, the Wawa. Right. The street views of the current property. We have Frank's storefront here. We have the back of house for Frank's here, as well as here. And we have um, Sonny's um, breakfast. Dresdner Robbins is our civil engineer, one of the best in the state, very technical group, uh, really worked hard to make sure everything is online and in, in accordance with, with the town's ordinances. Next one uh, is 1118, Brooks here with us right here, and she can speak to some of the architecture lately or uh, later, but we've designed, um, I think, 12 projects, 10 or 12 projects with 1118, very, very good group of architects. Next. Um, this starts getting more into the technical stuff, Bob. Is that, should I hand it off to, or you want me to run through the... Yeah, you know what, I have four or five more slides. I'll run through these and then we can, if you have technical questions about the architecture or the engineering, we'll hand it off to them. So just, just from a practical perspective, how do we want to designate these? Because, I mean, were these part of the packet? I think these, some, some things may be, some may be colorized versions, and at some point uh, i got to figure out what to call them when we establish a record. So at this point, I'm up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. i got 10 There's 19, different, 19, 19 of them. Okay. We want to call it a packet and call it um, submissions and identify them as we move along. We can call what, them. What will be the format that we'll give to the town so they have the Okay. How about A1? That sounds, sounds good, A1. And okay. A1 with different paginations, and we'll work it that way. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, this is some elevations of the project. It's I, I hesitate to show these sometimes because they're not photorealistic. They're just meant more for technical heights and widths of, and making sure that we're in, stand, in compliance with the bulk ordinances as to the amount of glass and brick and things like that. So this, these are just elevation profiles to show heights and widths. And um, here's a more of a photorealistic view from the ground um, showing what the street presence will look like when customers approach the facility and what they'll see on the road. Uh, this is a street view that we put, um, we had built to scale to put into the property to see what it looked like if you're driving uh, around on Somerset, I believe, from Wawa away from Rutgers. Um, here's another street view from the front of the building. Here's the uh, side view along, um, if you come in off Myrtle, correct? So Kevin Apuzio side, I'm sorry, this is the Kevin Apuzio side with the storage units and you know we kind of work to make sure that some people don't like seeing the, the storage doors um, so we've screened those so if you were to see the building from Kevin Puzio it just more looks like a modern construction of a building that that roadway there that's that's the on-site roadway yes, sir. so this is you're basically standing on the site yeah this is all on property on private property right thank you so. Um, this is the loading op, uh, loading entry from the opposite side on on Myrtle. That's off Myrtle Street behind the Wawa. And again, we recessed. This was two versions of TRC meetings with the group to make sure that this area was recessed and, and covered and protected. Okay. Um, this is a street from behind Kevin Apuzio, which is currently um, uh, Al, Al Latanzio owns this property, I believe. Is that Al's property back there? Backyard looking. This is the currently undeveloped property looking. Go to the next one. Quick shot of the quick serve restaurant. And again, these are fully uh, don't mean much because we need to come back to the board for approval. This is more just for. So um, I think that's our last slide. That's 19 of 19. So. I'll pre uh, present these to Ms. Woodbury. In fact, I'll put Paul to work. Would you give those to me? 
Here's a copy of every one of the slides that the board just viewed, marked as A1. So, uh, Paul, if you would, why Franklin Township? Why do you want to locate here? This is your moment to be glowing and complimentary. <laughs> um, I wish I had a very, very inspirational answer, but the answer is the numbers tell me where to go. Um, and then once the numbers say that there's demand in the facility for the use, we go and explore it. So um, when we came here, we saw Rutgers University. We saw a very long-standing town. We saw um, a lot of vibrant growth integrated with long-term, you know, people that have lived here. Not very, not a lot of turnover, not very transient. We like markets like that where we can have customers that need our services and stay for a long time. Um, you know, I really have uh, two rules right now for um, building self-storage. Um, one is it needs to be a, a new self-storage facility. I've owned lots of old properties that require lots of um, headaches and, and a lot of work. And the second is I, I won't build a self-storage facility unless I need to live in the town because I've had deals that were tough and they took me a year to overcome and you, you become part of the community during that time. So these check both the boxes in addition to all of the, um, all of the demand and, and construction and all the other. Would, great, would you describe for the board the typical operation of the self-storage facility? Yeah, we have typical operating hours. Um, typically from 8 a.m. we'll open and we'll be closed somewhere around five to six, um, depending on the day of the week. Um, we'll be open for those same hours on Saturday and limited hours on, on Sunday. Um, we typically have a few employees working in, in the facility and we'll typically generate anywhere from, for, a, si for a, a facility this size, we'll typically generate about uh, 12 to 20 visits per day at the facility throughout the course of our 10 12 to operation. 20 visits total per day? Yes, that's about And, and these are from the people who are running storage facilities, sites, yes, right? Yes, correct. What does that come down to? One and a half an hour, roughly? R roughly, based on the statistical data I have from 60,000 tenants. This could be an anomaly. I can't, I, I don't know that, but that's. So uh, I think in one of the staff reports, there was a request for peak hour flow. Yeah. So I don't know how you say one and a half cars. Maybe two two, two people per hour would we, be a we lot. Get, we could get, get, get crazy and double it and go with three and see if. <laughs> All right, so one of, the, one of the wonderful things about self-storage it's probably the lowest traffic generator of all the possible uses that are out there. Is that a fair statement? Based on my experience, yes. I think it's one of the lowest and based on the traffic. I, I would let the traffic consultants answer that. They look at retail, multifamily, industrial, but from all the charts I've seen, we're at the bottom. And then lastly, you heard me mention in my opening remarks that we're not seeking final site plan approval for the the rest, the, the uh, fast service uh, food facility because we don't have a tenant at this point. And we understand we have to come back for a final site plan approval, correct? Yeah, I don't want to build an empty box in the town. I, I'm going to need a tenant and that tenant needs to have your approval. So whoever that needs to be, we'll be back here with them to, to get your Terrific. Mr. Brown's available for questions. Any questions from the board? Ed? I'm not sure who to ask this of, whether it's you or the architect, but how many, I've, I've used the word unit, so you probably have a more precise term in the business of individual cubicle spaces uh, will there be in this building? It's typically dynamic. It can change depending on the demand, but the average is 105 across my whole portfolio. So we take the facility and divide it by 105, and that's the number of units. So here we were roughly about 1,000 to 800 to 1,000. Now I was trying to count up just the, on one floor, and I got up around 300. Yeah, just to ask the question. So. Any other questions from the board? You said 105, and then you said something about 500. To how many? How many? About 800 to 1,000. That's going to be determined as we go through planning. Question. Um, 
in your experience with all of your um, self-storage facilities, what type of uh, criminal activity have you had to combat? So when I first started, we would offer a lot of um, various rate for um, accessing the facility. Um, we've limited that to our operating hours unless you have a special reason and typically we don't grant very many reasons. Um, the other thing we've come to do is we've put a, a lot of cameras in the facility and we've noticed that if we monitor all the entrances, exits, and hallways uh, and let everybody know that we're, you know, that whatever's happening in the facility is being recorded 24-7, it's our crime rate has dropped down. But I would say on average, the amount of times I've called, I've had the police come to one of my facilities um, on about 100 properties in 10 years would be less than 10. So, I mean, very, very rarely. Is that less than 10 on one site or multiple <laughs> sites? Um, no, I mean, it, I've never had the police called twice at that same location before. Yeah, I mean, Charles, this, this line of questioning is not exactly um, MLUL criteria for, you know, approval. I mean, it, it's fine. It's well, fine we're to happy ask, to but we'll, we'll, we'll sort of end that there. So uh, go ahead and proceed with your next witness, Bob. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brown. My next witness is Grant Lewis, our professional engineer. I'd ask that he be sworn so that he can give testimony. If you could raise your right hand, do you swear the testimony you're going to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. If you could state your name, spell your last name, and give us your address, please. Grant Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. Uh, I work for Dresna Robin, located at 55 Lane Road, uh, Suite 220, Fairfield, New Jersey. Uh, Mr. Lewis, if you would, I, I don't remember when we were back here four months ago whether you gave your credentials to the board. Were you a witness I, at that time? I was a witness. I don't know if I was formally sworn in. Well, well accepted, just let's go ahead and... and Why don't we do it? Let's do the short version yeah. sure. of your credentials. Uh, I'm a professionally licensed engineer and planner in the state of New Jersey. That's all I need to know. Is that the capacity you're testifying in? Yes. Okay. Hopefully okay. no planning. Huh? Hopefully no planning. <laughs> so, uh, if you wouldn't mind, would you describe two things for the board? One, uh, one the subdivision, and then number two, the site plan that's before them tonight. Sure. Um, just to start off with a little bit of background, I, I know Mr. Smith had gone through it, but um, again, the property is located at lots 1 through 20, uh, block 163, as well as lots 19 through 34 in block 162. Uh, that is the lots affected by the site plan only. Uh, and then for the subdivision, there are the additional four parcels uh, identified as lots 35 through 38 in block 162, uh, which are to the north. Uh, of what you see on the screen and, and was presented on the site plan application. Uh, the site plan tract uh, minus those four lots consists of 2.52 acres um, with 2.75 acres if you include in the extra lots for the subdivision uh, portion. Um, the site is currently developed um, with an existing plumbing supply warehouse and a quick service restaurant. Um, all of these parcels lie within the uh, uh, Renaissance commercial zone. Um, to our northeast, we have residential properties located within the R7 uh, district. Uh, commercial properties to the southwest and southeast, also within the uh, RC zone. And across the, uh, Route 27, uh, we have commercial and multifamily uh, within the city of New Brunswick. Um, Currently, as, as I mentioned before, the sites are developed with the plumbing supply warehouse and the, uh, I'll call it a quick service restaurant, but Sonny's. Um, it's uh, a mixture primarily on site right now with the development of either building asphalt or broken gravel asphalt with some scrub shrub kind of lining the rear. Um, the site is relatively level uh, with some mild topographic relief that's pitching from the north to the south toward Route 27. Um, what we're proposing tonight uh, is the redevelopment of the property um, with a four-story, 39,000-square-foot self-storage facility and a one-story, 2,700-square-foot uh, quick-service restaurant. Um, 
just kind of walk you through uh, using my cursor on either one of the screens. Um, and, and maybe I should just back up just to give the board a little history. I, I know it was mentioned already um, by Mr. Brown and Mr. Smith, but uh, this application in, in our office was a part of the development very early on and in the early stages, uh, thanks to the cooperation uh, of, of many here at the township uh, during the TRC process, where we presented a conceptual site plan and through four or five rounds of revisions, um, you know, came to develop what we called a final uh, conceptual site plan, which was used for the amendment to the redevelopment plan, um, uh, as well as adjustments, uh, some significant adjustments for, for the better, um, to the site plan. So that was the basis for our entire site plan package that was submitted as part of this application um, to create what's identified in our bulk zoning uh, table as a fully compliant uh, application with the with the bulk criteria of the RC zone. Um, that being said, uh, I started off already with the buildings that we're proposing uh, that are going to be developed on two separate parcels, uh, the self-storage building back here on proposed lot, and uh, don't, I guess, quote me on the lot numbers because I know in one of the professionals review reports, I think they had some question on what the proposed lot numbers should be, which were happy to change and, and alter, uh, alter. So uh, on the rear lot, or what we've identified as lot, proposed lot 1.01 .01 will be the four-story self-storage facility. Uh, along the front of the property on Somerset Street, we have the quick service restaurant um, identified as lot 16.01. Um, be a little tough, but if you follow me, here is the proposed lot line uh, that divides the quick service restaurant with the uh, self-storage facility and then comes down to the outer tract boundary um, along Kevin Apuzio. The access uh, for the project will be provided via four driveway locations, um, two of which are egress only points on Kevin Apuzio. This was another element uh, that was developed during the uh, TRC meetings um, to limit uh, ingress uh, at these points. The third driveway would be a full movement driveway, uh, which is essentially an extension of Myrtle Street. Um, as some of you may be aware and, and is displayed here on the drawing, kind of in a faint hatched uh, dash line from the survey, Myrtle Street is partially improved right now. Uh, the second half of it closer to our property is unimproved. Um, it's certainly substandard to what a uh, township road has to be. So what we uh, are proposing as part of this application is a full extension of Myrtle Street with a road that is compliant with the township standards, 28 foot in width, two-way, full curb, uh, street tree plantings, um, in keeping with the uh, uh, design of the adjacent roads of Juliet and, and and other streets in the neighborhood. Uh, and then the final driveway, uh, which is our direct access to Route 27 uh, with a uh, egress-ingress uh, driveway that would service both the quick service restaurant and the self-storage facility. Um, just to clarify a little bit some of the circulation on site, um, if you enter via Somerset Street or Route 27. Uh, this driveway, which would serve both uh, the quick service restaurant and the self-storage facility, uh, will be uh, egress-ingress. Uh, you can then continue along, access the 10 parking stalls that are proposed uh, for the self-storage facility, uh, and then continue out and either if it were a uh, tenant of the self-storage facility, uh, you would then act enter um, some of those external uh, self-storage units that were shown on uh, Mr. Brown's um, earlier slides. Uh, if not, and you were uh, renting, likely renting one of the internal units, you would use uh, the covered loading spaces that were identified also on those earlier slides. Uh, those, just to give you a frame of reference, those covered loading zones are identified here by this uh, dashed box. Uh, there's two loading zones, 
uh, 12 foot by 30 foot with a 14 and a half foot clearance, which uh, I believe is compliant uh, with the township standards. Um, backing up uh, to kind of walk you through the circulation movement for the quick service restaurant, um, again, say either entering from Myrtle or from Somerset Street, uh, you would come in the main access driveway, enter in the parking lot for the quick service restaurant uh, where we're providing 16 uh, parking spaces uh, for the establishment. Um, there will also be a drive-through uh, connected with the tenant. Uh, and in order to access that, you would continue down the driveway where it narrows down to a one-way um, driveway because this, is again, is only a point of uh, egress out onto Kevin Apuzio. Uh, so you can either exit the property there or you can continue and, and enter into the drive through uh, and up to the teller and, and and again the details of this i don't i don't want to get into since they'll have to come back for uh final site plan approval but the exact location or the ordering signed and pickup menu and everything but um to that point though that was another um, uh, concern that we worked closely with the township professionals and and uh, uh others during the TRC process in order to provide a quick service restaurant layout and lo order menu location to provide the maximum amount of queuing. I know it was a great concern to uh, traffic and safety uh, with our original layout, which actually allowed cars, because this was also a point of ingress on Kevin Apuzio, uh, with a slightly different uh, layout to the drive through where queuing could have technically uh, if it backed up too much, would then come out the driveway onto Kevin Apuzio and potentially then impact the state highway. Uh, so to combat that, um, we came out with the layout that you see here. Um, this is an exit only, so there's no chance for somebody to enter in and enter into a queue that would continue out to Kevin Apuzio and the state highway. Queuing, um, if it became larger than, I believe we have 11 cars identified in the queue lane that can safely fit just within the driveway and a couple here in the one-way drive, drive aisle, but even if it ex, um, exceeds that, would just continue on further on site. So it would create an on-site circulation problem, but not a traffic safety problem for public roads and state highway. So let me just speak to that real quick over here. So I just wanted to reiterate, this is probably the third or fourth iteration of this layout for the, for the drive-through. Um, they are seeking preliminary site plan approval. So even though they don't have an exact user yet, they are in a way setting the template for what would be when they come in for final. So one of the things that, you know, as Mr. Lewis was saying, that, you know, we wanted the staff, particularly traffic safety, wanted to make sure there was the absolute maximum amount of queuing on site, including, again, in the drive-through, and then if there is backup, it's going to be in within their own parking lot, not on the street. So, the, so some of the things that are on here were specific recommendations of TRC, including again traffic safety, having the egress only out onto Kevin Apuzio, uh, and some of the other things. So this is basically setting, I, guess, I think, in the recommendation of TRC, a good template, kind of getting again the most amount of queuing on site possible, with some of the details to be determined when they come back for final. Interrupt, but no, I want. No. I, th I thought in this case it was important because of the extensive conversation with TRC that the board understood the nature of the co those conversations. No, thank you, Mr. Healy. And and um, uh, now moving on from the quick service restaurant, there was also an equal amount of conversation and and design input uh, that was uh, entered into the layout for the driveway of the self storage facility. Uh, as some of you may know, early on in that uh, TRC process, we had a layout which uh, extended the driveway out into Kevin Apuzio, effectively creating like an extension of Kevin Apuzio. It was a little bit of a hybrid of a half driveway, half public right away, uh, or public street rather, um, which was then uh, throttled back and created a completely on site uh, private driveway around the self storage building. Um, and one of the elements to provide a compliant uh, landscape screening buffer of 20 feet, which you see here in the rear, which is made up of a mixture of evergreens and uh, shrub plantings, amongst uh, what you may have seen on that previous slide of uh, decision, 
mature deciduous trees that will remain uh, and are identified on there. It kind of fills in uh, below the canopy for a complete uh, screening buffer, as well as that retaining wall uh, that uh, Mr. Brown had pointed out in one of his earlier slides. So what we have here is um, for those tenants that are renting the exterior units or maybe just accessing some of the other ones, um, uh, there's the security gate. You enter in through there. At this point, this becomes a one-way drive, 20 feet in width, which would be the minimum width that we wanted to provide for fire access lane. Uh, we've The remaining uh, driveway area is shaded um, to provide an area where people could pull off, uh, at least for the shaded area, which is an eight-foot lane uh, immediately adjacent to the building. Therefore, they could park their car adjacent to their unit, open up the door, uh, load and unload and then uh, not be blocking the fire access lane. Uh, what we have back here is sort of um, a, a remnant of the uh, asphalt area, but it was also important so that we could provide a uh, proper turning movement, uh, which we had worked with the fire official during the TRC process. Um, so uh, on one of the plans submitted to you, I believe it's a circulation plan, you'll see s some various turning movements that were modeled. Um, uh, for the uh, uh, township fire, uh, a typical fire vehicle, and uh, they extend out into that shaded area. So that's basically extra area to allow the fire truck to turn around those uh, bends in the building. Um, you then continue down around uh, the building, um, similar striping, similar width uh, in the fire access lane to the exit gate, exit out the gate, and then we uh, there are the uh, the closed refuse container for the self-storage facility. Uh, a similar refuse um, container is provided here for the quick service restaurant. And then you can continue and exit out onto Kevin Apuzio. Um, I spoke a little bit uh, about the landscaping uh, and as it relates to the residential screening along the north end of the property. Again, uh, it, it's a pretty extensive evergreen screening along the uh, rear with uh, comprised of eastern red cedar and Douglas fir. Uh, this again is mixed in amongst the existing uh, deciduous trees, tall uh, deciduous trees that will remain uh, just to fill in the canopy below. Um, this is this screening is also supplemented by uh, up to a, I believe it's a four foot high uh, modular block wall which is identified here on the on the rendering kind of starts in the northeast uh, of the building and wraps around to um, the northwesternmost corner. Uh, what then continues along is an um, ornamental decorative eight foot high security fence, uh, aluminum black powder coated fence, uh, which is in keeping with the uh, security gates as well that return it back to the building. So um, I think there was some question about security. Uh, so it's, you know, the external units are protected. Uh, as well as providing that extra level of screening as well. Just wanted to touch upon lighting a little bit. Um, for the self-storage facility, uh, the exterior lighting is primarily provided by 13 building-mounted LED fixtures at about 12 feet in height uh, above the finished grade level. Keep in mind, uh, just to give you some perspective to how that relates to the residential properties in the rear, the residential properties are about five, six feet higher than our finished grade around this building. So those building mounted fixtures are really only about six feet higher than, than their property. They're fully screened fixtures, uh, so light doesn't protrude uh, above a level plane. Um, and uh, our, our lighting plan shows uh, the performance of those fixtures as well as the pole mounted fixtures elsewhere on the site and um, the the minimus light levels once you reach the property line. So they provide the adequate security lighting and, and uh, operational lighting on site, but without the uh, spillage onto the adjacent parcels. Um, again, the remaining lights are uh, nine 15 foot high pole mounted LED fixtures. Uh, these are primarily provided up for the quick service restaurant as well as uh, along the main entrance driveway into the parcel. Uh, I already talked about the uh, the wall and the fence uh, that is along the rear of the property. Uh, not to bore the board with uh, some of the uh, 
Um, but just to give an overview, uh, the utilities are all generally run in a similar manner. Um, water, sewer, electric, gas, et cetera. Uh, water and sewer we've identified as uh, connecting with the existing utilities in Myrtle Street, coming down the main access driveway and then connecting with their uh, counterpart out in uh, Somerset Street um, with those utilities, uh, water and gas, the individual service laterals then tap off of them and provide service into both the self-storage facility and then the quick service restaurant in these general areas. Uh, sewer is provided via the existing sewer main uh, that uh, originates in Eugene Avenue, which terminates and turns into a paper street for further south. Um, that sewer main continues now um, through the property and uh, our service laterals would just come out of each building for a very short run, tap into the sewer main um, in what we're proposing, a 25-foot wide utility easement uh, via a saddle connection. So <clears throat> maybe I can uh, save us all some time, um, you know, since we're not engineers and CME is, and there's a lot of staff reports. Um, Generally, the way we try to operate things is just if there's a comment that you can comply with or disagree with or would like to discuss with the board, then do that. If you can comply with everything in a given report, just state that. Perfect. So it's appropriate to go to the reports, Mr. Chairman? I, I think you would be the best person to address that since you're you know, the engineer and the uh, and a planner, but like you don't want to hear Bob about said, stormwater. You, don't, you don't have variances. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's there's too much in, in terms of the architecturals that we really have to have to discuss. I mean, you're welcome to testify, but I, I don't think it'll be very short. Yeah. So wh why don't we do the Let's staff the reports? reports. Yeah. Okay. So so why don't we do shortest first? A little different. Okay. All right. So first we have the uh, public works report. Uh, Christine Woodbury to Raymond C. C. Frani, or it's from Raymond C. Frani, and it all refers to fire service where. We, we will comply with all of those requirements, correct? We'll comply. All right. Uh, number two, we had a report from the Franklin Township Police Traffic Safety Bureau dated February 11th, and all of those with regard are basically with regard to signage, and we will comply with all, correct? We'll comply. Uh, the last one, or, or the last short one, is the County of Somerset Department of Health, which has... Uh, uh, concern uh, with respect to a dumpster lo location and we do have a comment there uh, and the comment more or less refers to when we know who the the uh, tenant is correct right there was a concern about accessibility for the dumpster enclosure on the quick service parcel um, again this is something that was reviewed extensively during the design process um, and in order to provide adequate parking uh, and the maximum amount of parking for whatever tenant goes into the quick service restaurant, seeing as that's obviously important for both the tenant and the, and the public. Um, we didn't have the ability to twist that dumpster enclosure anymore in order to kind of face the uh, Wawa uh, more directionally so that, it, um, you know, in a perfect world, a garbage truck would be able to pull in. Nobody would have to get out. It noses right up to it and then dumps uh, the dumpster into it. But... Uh, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but just operationally, that will have to be adjusted a little bit uh, by the tenant. Uh, and either the, with the private hauler, they identify that it has to be picked up during non-operating hours. Um, and if that's the case, a, a garbage truck can easily swing into those parking spaces and nose into the dumpster enclosure. Or uh, if those operating hours aren't uh, permitted, uh, there's certainly many, many people in the state that have to have their garbage uh, in smaller containers, four cubic yards or less, which are on wheels, they're wheeled out into the dry bell, and then they pick it up with the, the cloth. So it's basically a report to be held until we come in for the final uh, that, That's plan. exactly what I was thinking. I mean, these are things that, you know, Somerset County Board of Health may, might be, I mean, she also says uh, plans for retail food establishment must be approved by health department. I'm sure once you have those final, then you'll, you'll comply. Yeah. All right. Next, if we could, the report from Robert Russo dated February 11th. Uh, we have no uh, objection or clarification of anything until we get to item 14. 
which is on page three of 12. And uh, item 14 says the applicant's professional should provide detailed information regarding the proposed screen wall near the quick serve restaurant drive through It appears the screen wall is located within the 15 foot front yard setback. This office defers to the board planner regarding whether this triggers a variance. And your response to that, uh, Mr. Lewis, is? Um, well, based on my discussion with both CME and, and Mr. Healy, uh, I don't, we don't feel that it's identified or, or requires a variance for the screen wall, even with its minor encroachment um, into the front yard setback as it's not a structure or connected with the building uh, and subject to that front yard um, minimum setback. Yeah, and I can confirm that. What they're proposing is a short um, ornamental wall to s provide screening for the drive through and that does not, uh, the setback requirements for structures does not apply. Again, take into, you know, bear in mind the materials aren't selected, but this is the wall that Mr. Healy's talking about, so it's, it's screened now, seen in an earlier slide. You know, and, and since I'm at the mic, I'll just add, um, Mr. Lewis, called me yesterday about one item that's in my report. I had indicated the need for a variance from the 25-foot uh, front yard setback for the drive-through canopy. Uh, and Mr. Lewis pointed out that and reminded me that the, the requirement is actually, the minimum is actually 15 feet from Somerset Street and a maximum of 25. And I read it as a maximum of 25 or minimum of 25. But the bottom line is they do not need a variance for the drive-through canopy. And the application with the, with the modification to remove the building mounted signs is fully compliant with zoning. Thanks, Mark. So back to Mr. Russo's report. Uh, at that point, we have no issues, and we don't even have issues with the traffic impact study comments. We're, we are happy to put a will comply with regard to everything. But if the board wants to hear any testimony, we do have our traffic expert, Mr. Foranda, here. Uh, we have no comments with regard to landscaping and lighting comments. Uh, the, uh, we have no comments with regard to the environmental impact comments. And there is a requirement, as uh, Mr. Brown knows, for an a, a, a conservation preservation area easement deed, which may be required. If it's required, we're certainly going to provide it. Correct, Mr. Brown? He's, that was, a, that was yeah. the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, on stormwater management, uh, we uh, agree with the engineer, but we do think that there are some additional calculations that we'd like to be able to show them. But for the record, we're happy to say we'll comply, and whatever the engineer ultimately says we need to do, we're going to do it. But we do want the opportunity to talk to him. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it is. Not uncommon to work things out with the professionals who know about such things. And. We have um, no e no uh, issues with the major subdivision plan. We do note item two, which says that the proposed numbering is not acceptable. Whatever is the correct numbering, we're going to revise on the plan, correct? Correct. All right. And then again, there's uh, providing deeds with the meets and bounds description for the proposed access and utility easements. And Mr. Brown has indicated we're happy to provide that. And whatever outside agency approvals we need, they're applicable, we'll provide them. There, there is, there's one item that I did want, to, not to sure. drag this out, but I thought it important because it's, it's really, uh, I, I think, up to the, the board uh, to make the official determination. But uh, Mr. Healy had noted uh, in his report about um, subject to board approval, we're providing a 24-foot wide drive aisle. Uh, for all two-way traffic, which was consistent with the conceptual plan that we brought to the workshop meeting and all of the TRC meetings. Um, uh, whereas I think township standard is 26 feet um, traditionally. Um, you know, I, from an engineering perspective, 24 feet is a industry standard for the drive aisle. Um, and in an effort to both increase the amount of parking on site for the quick service restaurant and as well as reduce the impervious coverage on the site, um, uh, we, we had reduced that to 24 feet, which is listed in the ordinance just with, I guess, the blessing of the board. Um, yeah, let me, let me yeah, the or normal requirement um, in, in elsewhere in the town, um, with the exception of, I think, Hamilton Street, it's reduced to 24 feet. Um, the normal requirement is 26. So they're not actually asking for a variance to go down to 24. The language of the ordinance basically says 
it's 24, but basically show the board, demonstrate to the board that 24 is good, depending on the layout of the plan. That's basically what it says. So um, that's one thing that, uh, so he, they basically need to prove that to you. Is it basically, safe and efficient? It's safe and efficient. That's the proof. Has the fire department approved? Four feet. We have their report, and that was not listed as a concern. I don't know that this go around. We ha do we have a report from the fire official? But I know it was something that was discussed um, with fire uh, during all of those TRC meetings. Uh, obviously, their concern and and. and the, Federal standard for the fire access lanes is 20 feet, so 24 feet is, is more than sufficient. The, the circulation plan, do you have the turning movements for a, the, the fire truck? Yes, we do. Uh, we identify a fire truck making the entire route from the Myrtle Street extension all the way around um, the one-way, more narrow, 20-foot-wide drive aisle of the self-storage building and then exiting out onto Kevin Apuzio, all with no problem. Mr. House has been in, was in those meetings with TRC and has been provided the plans for his review. Okay. Um, so far, we've received no objection. Okay. Um, That's all we can go on, really. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I have three things in my report that basically, similar to that, the applicant basically kind of needs to prove it to you. Uh, again, one is the residential buffer. Um, it requires a 20-foot wide buffer, which they've provided. Um, it needs to be six feet in height, and the plantings are six feet in height. Um, but they basically need to prove that uh, through the combination of walls, fencing, and evergreens, that it creates a solid uh, visual buffer as determined by the approving board. So uh, do you have, um, do you want to summarize the sufficiency described to you know, the, the nature of the buffer so that the board can, and I think you may want to also describe the, the, the retaining wall and the relative height of the building to the homes in the back. So I, I do believe the building is, you know, the finished grade, I think is five or six feet below the yeah, homes. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you provided that testimony. Uh, the general problem that I see uh, is when things go in, um, they're fine. And then as time goes by, you know, trees die or, or whatever, and they're not replaced or maintained. That's the bigger issue, right? Because as you testified, right, that the grade it only gives you six feet difference and your plantings are six feet high, so simple math says everything should be screened. But if the plantings are not maintained or d trees die or, or, you know, whatever, or something in your screening gets wrecked by somebody driving through it, <laughs> accidents happen, um, that, that's really the bigger concern, that, that it'll be maintained. And that may be more, more of a commitment from more of a you, the owner. <laughs> yeah. All I can give is my word that we operate facilities out there. Um, if some type of landscape ordinance in the town, I, there's been pro properties I've bought in the past that had a numerous amount of violations for not maintaining their landscape. I don't know if there's something similar here, but if there, oh yeah, yeah, it would be. This this approval would then become basically if if they if those plantings die, and they don't replace them in a, in a um, you know sufficient time frame, they can get a zoning they'll get a zoning violation made to replace, which is enforceable in the municipal court. So that's that's the insurance policy, but I think also. Too on on landscaping, don't we have to put up some kind of a performance bond for some period? For the of time? first few years, but then but then after that, you have a continuing obligation right. to maintain maintain the site consistent right. with your approved site right. plan. Right, and Mr. Brown said that's what he does, but if he doesn't, your insurance policy is the municipal court through a zoning violation. Exactly. You know, so so with that, I mean that that's always my biggest concern because, I mean. You've, you've done the calculations and your testimony is that between the screening and the plantings, you will completely screen the residences, which is important. And you provide the 20-foot buffer that's required. But if that over the years just somehow degrades, then that's, in my experience, the bigger problem. We, we agree and uh, you have a commitment from the applicant to maintain it. 
Uh, and one more question, because I, this, this, the questions that we did have a few people, uh, residents come in a, f uh, a few months ago when the application first, um, I believe there was notice to DEP. Uh, and one of the questions was the treatment of Eugene Avenue and whether Eugene Avenue was going to be extended or stay in its current um, state. Um, and my understanding, uh, reading the plans, is Eugene Avenue is not extending and it's staying as is. Is that correct and is that reflected on your site plan? Absolutely. That's an accurate statement. Um, what you can see here and what I've switched over to is the landscape rendering um, uh, from the site plan rendering. So you can see here, here's the Eugene Ave Paper Street uh, right away. Here's the end of the current um, asphalt on, uh, on Eugene to access lots uh, 30.01 and uh, lot 18. Um, and no improvements are proposed within, within this area of Eugene Avenue. Uh, simply the extension of Myrtle Street, and that stays within the 50-foot uh, wide right away of Myrtle. There, there's there's curb uh, on the Myrtle Street extension, concrete curb. Uh, there's going to be the street tree plantings. And then, you know, it doesn't show well here. I mean, this is the wood line from our survey, but, I mean, that will continue to maintain the woods that encompasses the label of Eugene Avenue. Council just redid the vacation of the further extension of Eugene Avenue out to Route 27. Apparently there was some minor technical flaw when it was vacated in 1975, so we did it again. That's correct. And, and, and by the way, that, that was one of the issues in the middle of the last 12 months. You know, our title company, uh, Mr. Raynone and uh, I think Mr. Hauk uh, and Mr. Healy sat down. Apparently, in, back in 75, there was a requirement that for the, the uh, vacation to occur, there had to be the filing of an easement for a utility, and it was never done. And nobody could find any records of it. So the way you cleared it up was to redo it. And that's what mm -hmm. they did, and that's why you redid it. Uh, you know, went forward with it. <clears throat> All right, so uh, before we leave the engineering testimony and get to your architect, do we have any questions for? All right. Yes, I, I have oh. questions. Go they ahead, don't, They don't involve crime, OK? OK. All right. Um, <laughs> I have a concern about, a serious concern about the the closeness between this, the entry to this project, the northernmost driveway, and how close it is to uh, Wawa. Uh, these are, um, I think, I think Wawa's to the north there, right? Yes, That's the driveway, here, this right? is the limits of their depressed curb coming right. out. Those driveways are very close for two locations that are going to be attracting high volumes of traffic, if that is a restaurant. To have two entries and exit points that close together on a very busy roadway such as this is of concern. So in your engineering judgment, uh, what's your response to that? Well, I can tell you that, one, we've submitted to DOT for a major access permit without traffic review. Uh, that's just the name of the permit. Um, and that it's currently under review. Prior to that, though, we had had a pre-application meeting with the DOT. And uh, at that meeting, they expressed no concern or issue with the proximity of one driveway to another, uh, knowing that the Wawa had been developed uh, and, and reviewing the pictures. And we were there. Um, the applicant was there as well, and we were reviewing uh, Google Earth. So not only were they presented with the concept plan, which had the driveways in these locations, um, uh, but one of the other items they noted was that they were not, uh, it was not required to restrict any of the turning movement either uh, for our driveway uh, egressing onto Route 27. So it's within the state sta standard. So which department in the state, uh, DOT, did you meet with in, in review of this application? Yes. Which one? Which, which group in DOT did you meet with in view of the application? 
I just want to know because I work with DOT all the time. It would be um, the so access permit division, it, right? It was the access to permit, and it, as a major, it was down in, uh, that was handled in the uh, main office down in Ewing. Okay. Yeah, I just want to point out on record that there are a few examples, if any, along 27 that have two uses such as this adjacent to each other with ingress and egress that close together. And given the number of injuries and fatalities that result um, based on that volume of traffic and behavior on that roadway is very concerning. Just well, want to state that. And I'd like to point out, too, that was one of the other developments during the uh, TRC process was so that this was not the sole means of egress and ingress. That's why we have the Myrtle Street extension. The whole purpose of the Myrtle Street extension is to allow people uh, either uh, – primarily leaving the quick service restaurant or the self-storage building can head out on Myrtle and go down to the signalized intersection on Juliet. So they're not 100% dependent on that one point of right. egress. But in doing so, you're now adding additional traffic to an area where pedestrians have not experienced such traffic volumes. The community have not experienced those traffic volumes. And there is no sidewalk prote protecting pedestrians on that street. So Which that street then you? Myrtle Street, where you're now proposing as a potential exit. So then that becomes a concern as well. The other concern I have is the possibility of a car being stuck in the driveway with no emergency exit. A lot of the drive through restaurants we have here, at some point, you're able to get out of line and exit the the drive-through. Here, that's a significant number of cars potentially that will be parked in that driveway with no way out. I just wanted to point that out as well. That's the hey, can you use a microphone? We have, we have our traffic expert. You may remember we said, do you want him up or not? So why don't we get him up? Uh, let's ask Mr. Ferranda, Andrew Ferranda, our traffic expert, to be called and sworn so that he can give testimony. <clears throat> so let me, let me frame this a little bit before you get, you go, you get into this, because uh, I want this to be, like, super brief. Uh, as we all know as planners, or should know, we don't have jurisdiction over state highways. Is a fully compliant application. We also know from case law that we're unable to deny applications on the basis of their traffic volume. The way that is controlled is through zoning. And this is fully compliant with the zone. So I really don't need traffic testimony unless there's something unique or unsafe or unusual about this type of use in this setting. I mean, it, hopefully everybody goes to the planning course that the, they offer so we don't have this kind of distraction. So let's move on to our architect. How many feet are between the two exits? You would be looking at about 50 feet, not including, and, and that's not taking this. 50, that's 50 feet? Approximately. Because there's a significant flare on that driveway for, so depending on where you're measuring, center line of the driveways or not. Look at center line to center line, that would probably be more like 100. With the chairman's direction, I would like to, architect, please. Ask that she be sworn, Ms. Brooke Shea. You swear the testimony you're going to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. If you could state your name, spell your last name, and give us your address, please. Brooke Che, C-H-E-A, -E uh, address is 156 Dempsey Way, Orlando, Florida, 32835. I'm with 1118 Architecture. Registered architect in New Jersey. And I'm a registered architect in Florida, but one of the principals of the firm is also a registered architect in New Jersey. She just wasn't able to attend. But we've both been working on the project. Uh... In, in she, she can be a fact witness as to the plan. She can't testify 
as an professionally as an architect because so go away <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the, the, the thing speaks for itself I mean it's a I'll, gorgeous gorgeous I'll, I'll say this I mean I'll, I don't know if the board does but I, I don't I'm really have any issues with the architecture I mean I'll, okay like you pointed out correctly most self-storage facilities look rather bland I think this is not that um, and I guess we'll hear more about the restaurant when it when comes, it comes to fruition. In, in that case, Mr. Chairman, we that completes our case. So, you know, I would just want to clarify one thing, especially for Charles. I don't mean to pick on Charles necessarily or, or anybody, but <clears throat> we're a quasi-legal board here. And we can rail against things that we may not like, like tree loss, and we try to mitigate that because we have – you know, a very good tree replacement plan, the ordinance of which I happened to write when I was shade tree chair. So I know it's good. We also have, you know, the ability to zone in a certain way. We, we can't, and I'm saying this to members of the public to hopefully mitigate anything that they may come forward in the public portion. We, we can't, um, we, we may not like certain things, but there's only certain things the board can control. So the state highway being 27 is a state jurisdiction. This was on a township street, totally. But we still couldn't restrict you or anybody because of, of traffic. The way to do that is to make sure that if you think the traffic is going to be an issue, you, you conform your underlying zoning to what, to what that should be so, so that you don't have the problem because then you, you place an undue burden on the applicant. I, I, think, I think that's the law. So, you know, just, just to kind of clarify that, you know, I, I'm not up here being flippant about any concerns. It's just I want to direct the board as to what we can control, and there's no sense wasting time at 10 to 10 of, of things that we can't. So with that, before we open it to the public, let me uh, ask if the board has any questions for any of the witnesses. Just, just a short question of uh, curiosity. Uh, in the report, on page six, there is a um, drawing which delineates the uh, lot, uh, uh, the lot, and uh, there's a block 162, lot 3501, which on another map is shown as lot XX, and I assume nothing is being done with that, that it's being left as a green area. Is that That is correct. Uh, those are the parcels 35, 36, 37, and 38 are the parcels, uh, one of which is being swapped in order to create this overall lot, which is we needed lot 34. We gave them two other parcels in order to create compliant sized parcels. Four of them with common ownership are being lumped together to create uh, a two, I think it's 200 foot frontage in a compliant lot. That's the portion that's the subdivision at part of the application no. uh, with no development proposed. Yeah. Thank you. And, and is that no development could ever be proposed? Is it restricted in some way? or It won't be owned by us, so it's up. Okay. It's in, it's in the residential zone. Oh, okay. Well, if it's not owned by them and it's it's not part it, of their application, then I can't. Well, really it's on, it's on a, it has frontage on a paper street. Yeah. So it's basically a lot that's there, and maybe at some point somebody else may put a house on it. But but the street would have to be developed. To do yes. That. yes. All right. Which but, we've but heard no has been vacated. Right. Well, that that's the, that's another. This is the uh, this is a different street. But nonetheless, no, no, there's no development proposed in association with, with this application. But it's still part of the subdivision. Yes. Okay. Any other questions from the board? I would like to again raise my concern about your drive-through, of which you do have jurisdiction over and you have yet to respond to. Uh, so the concern for the drive through was the number of cars and lack of yes, uh, escape routes? Yes. Um, it is record. So this drive through currently allows for maximum stacking with no potential emergency exit should something occur in the drive through. It's a high volume, potentially a high volume restaurant. You're expecting to see a lot of cars. Other developments along 27 provide for an emergency exit out of that driveway or to drive through should something happen. This one does not, and I just simply want to hear from the engineer that that is safe as designed. 
s safe as designed. I, I, I agree with you. It's not uncommon now that you would have perhaps a double wide drive through, um, you know, with maybe two ordering boards, most of those neck down to a single driveway then for the pickup window. So that there is a bottleneck as well. So uh, why we don't have the space to provide that additional width to allow people to exit once they're in the queue uh, and continue around, um, I, I certainly don't think it's an, uh, feel it's an unsafe condition. Perhaps a nuisance if someone breaks down in the line and a tow truck has to get to it, but. Well, on the positive side, I, I, I again, um, commend you and, and the township staff for working for the queuing because if, if you if you want to be trapped somewhere God help you if you're on the Dunkin Donuts and Schoolhouse Road. All right why don't we uh, why don't we open to the public. Make a motion to open to the public. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meetings open to the public for this application if you want to come uh, forward to the podium. Um, be sworn in by our planning board attorney and give your um, name, spell your name, last name, and give your address. Good evening. How are you? If I could swear you in real quick. No. Can just you just pull the microphone? Pull the microphone down, down and you if you could just raise your right hand for me. Do you swear the testimony you're going, the testimony you're going to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. And if you could state your name, spell your last name, and give us your address, please. Miss, Miss, we cannot hear you. You have to have the mic right in your face so that we can hear you. Check it to see if it's on. It might have been turned off by the last person. I don't know. Work around. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ali Matuko. Um, my is A L I M A T U. Last name is C O L E. I live in 56 Eugene Avenue, Somerset, New Jersey, 08873. Um, I'm, I live on um, Eugene Avenue. We have concern um, on Eugene Avenue, but he already s mentioned something about because our main concern was the opening of the street, which is the street is too small. And the kids go to school, and the, the bus is there. And if traffic keep going back and forth, it's going to be devastating. So, but they already addressed that part of it. Our second concern is the traffic, is the um, the noise, and we don't know how we're going to do with the noise because we already got the wawa noise already in the evening. Where you know, so we're wondering now how they're going to reduce the noise level because we just leave it. It's going to impact the two neighbors in the back by the was the Myrtle Street. We call that back street. And the other, um, the other tenant on the, on the Eugene Avenue, which they're going to impact, they're going to be really impacted with the noise. And um, because we were not sure about, they're going to open the street. We did have a petition, because we we're afraid that they're going to open the street. So, and we have a note from, from um, that um, we wrote. I just read a few of them. Um, it says the extending the extending of Eugene Avenue Myrtle Street will increase traffic and has a crime within a very low crime rate. Neighbor, the last the last thing any of us need with Franklin Township is the um, as property owners, taxpayers, it's simple. Somerset County, New Jersey, to. Of Eugene, Eugene Avenue, okay, <laughs> Eugene Avenue, Eugene Avenue with Myrtle Street within the township of Franklin. We would like to prevent further diminished quality of life. We would also like to add the possible solution by suggesting the interest to be placed on the Kevin Apuzo Avenue side of the facility. Um, this is the, we, we had some concerns. I will hear um, just to let you know and um, concern about safety also and the noise level and how high if they're going to have like a wall um, to prevent the noise or something like that because it's a quiet neighborhood. We've been there for years and we don't want all this noise and crime there, every, you know, um, because when you have all those things, there's a tendency you're going to have more crimes. 
So that's our concern. And this is from all the the people on Eugene Avenue. I have this letter. I don't know if you guys want to take it or just it's yeah, okay. We, we, we can. Um, so so maybe to address that a little bit. Uh, so as you already pointed out, right, Eugene Avenue will stay the way it is. Um, and and council just made sure of that. Um, you do have the you know, twenty foot buffer and the screening uh, in the back. And I would assume that since it's, I mean, I can believe the Wawa generates noise because I mean, that's just that kind of use. Uh, fortunately, the one thing that probably would generate the most noise, it, it, which is the the restaurant, is towards the front, oh, furthest away from the residences. And the, and the thing that probably will generate the least noise is a self-storage facility, I would think, just because of the volume. I mean, you just don't have, you know, 100 people storing stuff at the same time. Just to And the hours of operation. And it oh, closes we're on a nighttime at night. operation. And, and, and uh, Bob, it can you re re reiterate? I, I missed yeah, Mr. Been. Brown testified <laughs> that the normal operation of the self-storage facility is 8 or 9, to 6 p.m., all right? Yeah. It's not a 10 o'clock operation at 12 o'clock or around the clock operation like Wawa. So you have the quietest possible use in a self-storage. You had 10 to 12 people visiting the entire facility during the operating hours. That building is going to be the best sound buffer they could possibly have. So is there some, like if somebody just wanted to try to get into their self-storage facility, like an outside unit, at, at say midnight, they, they couldn't possibly, they just couldn't do it, right? We, I, I, we, I we give special exemptions. It's less than, less than, less than 1%. Which, I mean, there's people that need to get into their stuff in off hours, but we do not, it's not normal procedure. So I can't testify. And, that and they no would have to like contact the, the management yes, to say. they have to have special exemption and it's cleared. And it's, it's only for business use or an emergency use, you know. Would, would the applicant like to address any of the other um, and, comments? Well, I guess speaking to the point of the traffic, and I think a lot of that is, is addressed by now stating that Eugene Ave is not being extended. It, the, the woods that you see now uh, and the end of Eugene Ave stays exactly the same. Um, as it is, um, it, it was uh, stated by Mr. Smith that we have a four-story self-storage building. Uh, I can't think of a better sound screen uh, or wall to what is a more intense use of the quick service restaurant that's directly in front of it. So you have not only that self-storage unit acting as a buffer uh, visually uh, uh, for, for light, for sound, um, and to the added point, there's not only the 20-foot buffer, which I described in my earlier testimony, that's made up of the landscaping, the existing trees that will remain in that 20-foot buffer. You then have the retaining wall that provides a vertical separation. Uh, so picture uh, our, first, our ground floor is six feet lower than uh, or more than the nearest uh, Eugene Ave uh, resident. Um, and then you have... 57 feet of separation between our building and the property line. That portion of the driveway in the rear that's adjacent to Eugene Ave uh, and, and you and your, and your neighbors uh, is secured by a gate. So the issue of uh, uh, security and traffic, I mean, it's just, you, you don't even have the potential then for someone leaving the quick service restaurant maybe at a later time to go around the back of the self-storage facility and, and generate noise and, and headlights and, and things like that, so. A anybody else wishing to come? Seeing no one else coming forward, I would move that the public hearing on this application be closed. Second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, anything to say in summation, Bob? Well, the 30-second summation, which is, you know what Frank's Hardware looks like, you know what Sunny's Restaurant looks like. This is a very, very underutilized, not, not the crown jewel in Franklin's uh, crown, this is an opportunity to really dramatically enhance that property with a 
gorgeous facility, new jobs, new rateables, but aesthetically very pleasing, and provide new services for your town. I think it's a grand slam out of the park home run. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve this application, noting that they will come forward uh, at a future time when they have a tenant for the restaurant, the fast food restaurant. So preliminary and final for the storage, preliminary for the uh, um, fast food and the subdivision, which will be final for both. Yeah. Second. I'll second. Councilman Chase. Yes. Coral Hauk. Yes. Mahir Rafiq. Yes. Cecile McIver. Yes. Robert Mettler. Yes. Charles Brown. Yes. Jennifer Ragnow. Yes. Cal Schmidt. Yes. And Chairman Orsini. Yes. Thank you. You have anything else, Mark, Christine? Okay, so with that, our next meeting is March. March 3rd. Okay. Motion to adjourn. So Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting is closed.